Uh, we're into uh, chapter 11. Uh, I've hand, asked Ashish to hand out today a revision of the previous version of chapter 11, plus chapter 12 on the sum product algorithm in case we get to it. Uh, giving you a complete copy of the problem seven solutions for both weeks. And uh, get back on track, we're handing out problem set eight. Uh, there probably will only be one more problem set that you hand in. All right, we've been getting to the centerpiece of uh, uh, the second half of the course, which is codes on graphs, which is the way we're going to get to capacity achieving codes uh, by building them on graphs of linear complexity and decoding them on the graphs with iterative decoding. Uh, I frame this in the language of behavioral realizations. I say a graph is a realization of a code via a behavior, which is the set of all the possible trajectories on the graph. So this is, again, putting it system theory language. Uh, I want to distinguish between two types of variables, the uh, external ones, which communicate with the outside world. Uh, in our case, these will be the symbols in a code word. Uh, these are the ones that are actually involved in the code. And then we, so these are more or less pre-specified for us when we're trying to realize a code. Uh, but we can adjoin auxiliary variables, internal variables, we often call them state variables, hidden variables, latent variables, uh, which are really there for our convenience. They're to make the realization simpler or more elegant in some way or to have properties or whatever. But these are, these are free for us to add because uh, they're inside the box and the world never sees them. Now, we describe the behavior by a set of constraints uh, on the variables, which in our case, these are local constraints that only involve a few of the variables, each one. Uh, the idea is to express a global behavior via local constraints on variables. Uh, and uh, in our case, the constraints will be expressed by equations, as we've seen, uh, or in a little bit more generality, by little, little codes, uh, which will go in to make up this big code. So in some sense, you can think of codes on graphs as being making big codes out of little codes, making global codes out of local codes. Uh, the behavior, then, is simply defined as the set of all combinations of variables, both external and internal, that satisfy all the constraints. If we can find a set of values for all the variables uh, such that all these local constraints are satisfied, uh, then that's called a valid uh, trajectory or whatever. And that's the entire behavior. And the code is simply the set of all uh, external variable n-tuples that occur as parts of valid behaviors. In other words, the projection of the behavior just onto the external variables. All right, so it's an, it's an elegant and rather implicit way of describing the code, but we'll see it's very, very powerful. And last time, we talked about various styles of realizations. Uh, I gave you examples of generator representations, and parity check representations. This is really where it all started with parity check representations, where this style of graphical representation is very natural. Uh, you've, got the, you've got the symbols in the code. Those are your, the only symbols you need. And you've got parity checks. And the parity checks constrain the symbols. If you've got n minus k parity checks, you've got n minus k constraints. And that, it's a uh, kernel representation in the language of uh, linear algebra. Uh, it's simply the set of all code words, the set of all code n-tuples that satisfy all the parity checks. That's it. We don't need any hidden variables. In a generator representation, uh, this is a more natural representation when we're trying to generate or simulate uh, a code. We want to uh, run through a set of inputs that, uh, uh, in effect, create all the outputs, all the code words. In this case, we don't actually see the inputs as part of the code words, necessarily. We might, we might not. 
but we distinguish them in this representation, and we regard the inputs as hidden variables or state variables, if you like. They're part of the realization, but they don't actually occur in the code word, so they fit into the hidden category. Okay, and we talked about uh, two styles of graphs, uh, uh, Tanner graphs, which are older and more established. Tanner really wrote the foundation paper in this subject in 1981. I regard him as the founder of the subject of codes on graphs. Uh, however, uh, like a lot of good papers, his was completely ignored. Uh, oh, that's almost true for 25 years, and then it was rediscovered with the general interest in, uh, I should, sorry, not 25, 15 years, and then it was rediscovered around 1995 when people began to wake up to this subject again. And Tanner graphs really come out of this idea. Uh, they're closely associated with that. We can generalize them to be more like this, but it's just simple idea. We have a bipartite graph. We make one class of vertices into the variables, uh, one class into the constraints, and we simply tie a variable to, con to a constraint when it's involved in the constraint. And we can generalize it by making internal and external variables, which we have to distinguish in the picture in some way. And uh, the constraints, uh, initially they were just zero-sum constraints in parity check codes. One of the things Tanner did was said, well, they could be any codes. Uh, a single parity check is, the, is like a single parity check code, and uh, we can make any codes the constraints. And the edges don't work very hard in the Tanner graph. Uh, they uh, implicitly carry the variables to the constraints, so we could label them with the variables. And we showed how a Tanner graph could always be transformed to this normal graph, which I think is, for certainly in more complicated situations, a cleaner way of explaining things uh, and cleaner in a variety of senses. Here, here's our taxonomy. Vertices indicate constraints. Half edges indicate external variables. That's a half edge is something you can tie to another half edge to form an I.O. pad. Edges are tied together to constraints. They're internal, and so these represent the internal variables. And uh, this is cleaner both analytically. There's this nice duality theorem about normal graphs that I won't be presenting to you, and a couple of other things. Uh, they're cleaner when you come to implement the sum product algorithm. Uh, I think they're just generally cleaner, uh, but I may be biased. I want you to see both because these still predominate in the literature, although more and more people seem to be using this style of graph, and that's what I'll use in the course. All right, so that's the review of where we are. Okay, uh, today we're going to go on to other important styles of realizations, and particularly uh, the next one we'll talk about is trellis realizations. So this will tie back to all the work we did in Chapter 10. And what did we discover in the chapter 10? The key to a trellis realization was a trellis-oriented generator matrix. And again, I will put up our favorite matrix on the board, the generator of the 844 Reed-Muller code. And in the form we've come to know and love, it looks like this. And what makes it trellis-oriented is that it, you know, all the starting times are different and all the ending times are different. Therefore, these generators are as short as possible. The main feature of this generator that we want to look at is the spans, the active parts of the generators, which we've made as short as possible. And let me explicitly write out what they are. The first generator is active from symbol time 0 to symbol time 3. This one is active from 1 to 6. This one is active from 2 to 5. And this one is active from 4 to 7. Okay, so those are the active spans, and we know from that uh, we can find the dimensions uh, of minimal state spaces and of minimal branch spaces. Okay, we just count the number of active generators at either the state times, which are 
between the symbols or the symbol times themselves for the branches. Okay, again, quick review. Especially because we have a few guests here who we haven't seen previously in the course. So that's where we've been. All right. Uh, once you have any generator, any generator matrix, or in particular a trellis-oriented generator matrix, the code is simply described as the set of all linear combinations of the matrix elements. Okay, and in particular, the code symbol at every time is a linear combination of the matrix elements in a particular column. All right, so let's use that to get a trellis realization. Uh, I've done this in various ways. I'm still not satisfied. Uh, the, the way that I do it in the notes is quite uh, notation heavy and uh, mathematical. I hope this picture of how, what we're going to do is going to give you a totally transparent idea of what's going on. Okay, let's think that we're going, let's, we're going to have a trellis realization. We'll, let's write down the symbol times, and I'll write them all the way across the board. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And let me save the coefficients ui here in, uh, I'll write them as equality constraints, but you could also think, them as a, think of them as a little binary shift register. I'm going to need u1 at four different times. I'm going to need u1 during its span at times 0, 1, 2, and 3. So I'll set up a set of constraints here to propagate u1 between these three times. All right, and u1 is going to be an internal variable. Strictly, there are three replicas of this internal variable here. And I can pull it out at each time, too. So, uh, so I've, this is uh, where I'm going to keep u1, in effect. Similarly, u2. I'm going to uh, keep around for all the times that I need it, which is these six times. Okay, so those are all the, t is that six? That's only five. These are all the times that U2 is actually involved in the output symbol. So I'm going to have it when I need it. Uh, U3 I need for four times. I've been inconsistent in whether I write the variables or the values of the variables. In this case, I'm writing values. And finally, U4. Let's see, I'm going to need more than one board here. So now I've got everything I need at the time that I need it. Now, this is going to be tricky. Uh, I'm simply going to have a linear combination, call it G0, G1, and so forth, which is going to create my output at time 1, uh, time 0, or time 1 or time two, and so forth. And you will agree from this generator matrix that the output at time one is some linear combination of U1. And the output at time two is some linear combination of these two guys. Okay, and the output at time three is some linear combination of these three guys. So forth. You see what I'm doing? So I'm I could describe these as simply a linear constraint. What are the possible combinations of inputs and outputs in this constraint? And similarly, 
And don't make me draw the lines in. Okay, so uh, I claim this is a realization directly from this trellis oriented generator matrix. Yes? This is online in the, in the generator G as a zero inside. Right. So do you force the component to be zero in the linear combination, or you, or you mean? I, I can do it that way. Uh, clearly, I don't need this input at this time, so I could erase that. Does that make you feel better? Actually, that gives an even better picture. It's not going to make any fundamental difference, but I can actually, I'm doing this for a generic set of generators that cover these spans. All right, for the particular ones we have here, yes, I can make that further change and eliminate those two inputs. But I'm shortly going to aggregate this and put it in a, uh, in a more aggregated form. And what's happening internally here then won't matter to us very much. OK. And notice that uh, the I can sort of regard this as the branch space at this time. Uh, and it has the right dimension for the branch space at each of these times. And well, let me, all right, let me take it a little more slowly. First, I claim it's a realization. If I built that thing with the appropriate linear combinations here, then the behavior of this is the set of all, basically the set of all U's and Y's that satisfy all these constraints. And if I just look at the outputs, that's the set of all code words, right? So I've, I've constructed a behavioral realization in a certain way. OK, and now I'm going to start to aggregate. Aggregate just means drawing lines around subgraphs. Or sometimes in the notes, I call this agglomeration. All right, so I'm going to regard all this as one constraint on the variables that, are, that come out of this. The constraints that are affected by this agglomeration, the variables that are affected are y0 and u1. OK, so this I can draw, let me draw it this way, as a little constraint code, which operates at time 0. And it's a linear 2, 1 code that basically ties together y0 and u1. OK? whatever the relationship between them is. It probably is the y0 equals u1. That's the way, since u, the first generator starts at this time, that's about the only thing it can be. Similarly, I'm going to aggregate all this part of the realization here and consider it a big block or a big constraint. At time 1, there's some constraint that affects y1 and u1 and u2. All right, so this is a little 4-2 code on the four incident variables. One of the constraints is that u1 on this side equals u1 on this side. These are really two replicas of the same thing. So there's an equality constraint propagating through there. And then I have some function of y1 as a function of u1, which I'm going to regard as the state at this time. And u1 and u2, let me call that the state space at time 1. Let me call this at time 0. Let me call this the state space at time 1. And uh, I did go through a development where I showed that these u's could be regarded as the components of the state spaces. This is a, a more constructive way of seeing the same thing. And notice they have the right dimensions. So the states are what carry the information from time 0 to time 1, just as we would want. They're, they kind of embody the Markov property, yes? Why is C0 less than 2? Why is C0 
Link two, because it affects two bits. All right, it affects these two bits. There is only, uh, uh, let's see, how did I know that there's only one possible con constraint here? Because that's the dimension of the branch space. It's really a, all determined by U1. All right. Over here, however, it's determined by U1 and U2. So the dimension is 2. U1 and U2 are free, uh, and the others are fixed once we know those. So I was a little ahead of myself there. And similarly, let's keep drawing in this fashion. Here's a constraint code at time 2, which relates these possible variables, u1, u2, u3, which I'm going to call the state space, at time 2. My times are not what I expect, uh, but it's always really a problem to keep the index indexes consistent. We want state space, state time one to occur after the first symbol. So this should be state time two, this should be state time three, to be consistent with what's in the notes, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and so forth. What is the length of this code? It's simply the number of bits that it controls which is 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What's the dimension? It's, uh, you, it's 3 because u1, u2, u3 are free. If I only look at this constraint independent of everything else. OK, and continuing this way, at this point, you notice I only have u2 and u3. So my state space at time 4 has gone down in dimension. And here I have C3, which is, again, a 6-3 code, and so forth as I go ahead. Let me, let me just draw it. This is also a 6-3. This is time 5. State space at time six. This is back down to one. Four. It's symmetrical on this side, as you know. Okay, so that's my, that's my trellis realization, and I claim this too is a realization in the sense that any combination of U's and Y's that satisfy all of these constraints is a legitimate trajectory, trajectory and the set of all Y's that are part of those legitimate trajectories form the code. In fact, you know, it's pretty explicit here that the dimension of the code is 4, corresponding to u1, u2, u3. So I have a, eight outputs. I have 16 possible behaviors. I pick off the combinations of u's and y's that could make that, which is basically determined by this matrix. And I just pick off the y's, and that's my 8-4 code. OK, so that's, that's what the trellis looks like. Uh, the constraint code really embodies the branches. This is everything that can happen. This capsulizes everything that can happen at time zero. This encapsulates everything that can happen at time one. It controls the, the U's are really my state spaces. This constrains state, output, next state in nice linear system theory style. This tells me what combinations of state, output, next state I can have at time two, and so forth, across the board. So the constraints con are local constraints, local in time in this sense, that constrain what can happen as you get to the next state. Once you get to the next state, the state has the Markov property. This is all that the memory you need of the past in order to determine the future, or the whole set of future possibilities. 
Uh, each of these is a linear vector space uh, over the ground field. In fact, it's just the space of one tuples, two tuples, three tuples, two tuples, and so forth. And uh, it has certain dimension, in this case, equal to its size. And if you calculate the dimensions of, call this the state space, call this the, uh, the branch constraint code, if you like, uh, the branch space, it's isomorphic, uh, the dimensions are minimal here by construction from the trellis-oriented generator matrix. The, if we want to know the minimal size of the state space at time uh, four here in the center, we just calculate the number of generators that are active at time four, and that's precisely what we're going to get over there, too, by our construction. If we want to compute the dimension of the branch space at time three, it's the number of active generators at symbol time three. There are three active ones, and we've just forced this to have that structure. So, so this is a minimal, this is the, this is a normal graph of a trellis realization of a minimal trellis realization of the 8-4 code. Okay? So we can clearly do that for any code, right? For any code, we can find a trellis-oriented generator matrix. We can go through these steps, and we'll always come up with something that looks like this down here. Okay, now, what are the properties of this graph? Does it have cycles? Does this graph have cycles? Anybody? No? There's one answer I get. What's the other possible answer? Anyone want to? How many people say no and how many people say yes? I want to see a show of hands. How many people think this graph is cycle free? Okay, and how many people think that it has cycles? Okay, the majority is wrong. This graph clearly has cycles. Here are two edges here, and here's the cycle. Okay, so as a graph, it has cycles because it has multiple edges going between these constraints. All right, so uh, a good thing to do is to make this a cycle-free graph, and that's just a matter of regarding this as instead of two binary variables, we regard it as one quaternary variable. All right, so we're going to regard this as a single quaternary variable of dimension one. This is a single binary variable, dimension one. This is a quaternary state space. There are four possible states here. So the dimension of the state space at this time is two. So when I draw abbreviations like this, You can think of them as having, as being decomposable into binary variables, if you like. But the advantage of drawing them as larger variables, higher valued variables, is that now, does this graph have a cycle? No, this graph is cycle free. Uh, I've just gotten rid of all the possible cycles. How can you tell if a graph is cycle-free? Various ways. I think the most elegant one is to say if every edge is by itself a cut set, then the graph is cycle-free. If I remove any edge, then I decompose the graph into two parts. And that's clearly true of this graph. It, we don't really have to test the half edges. so. Uh, in fact, this is kind of the defining concept of a state space. A state space is kind of a cut between the past and the future. When we asked about the minimal state space, we asked, you know, what's the minimal dimension of the information, the state, that we need to pass from the past to the future? Uh, and so states correspond to cuts. If we make each... Uh, state space, if we consider it to be a single variable, then we get uh, just a chain graph 
on a sequential time axis, as is conventional in system theory. This is your conventional integer time axis for discrete time systems. In this case, it only has a finite number of times where anything happens, but you can think of this as part of the infinite set of integers. And so this is everything that happens, and a trellis is always going to be very boring. It's all, always going to look like this. But the advantage of now we have this cycle-free graph realization, we'll find out that we can do exact decoding of cycle-free realizations using the sum product algorithm, uh, or the min sum algorithm, which in this case uh, kind of reduces to the Viterbi algorithm with an asterisk on it. And the cost of doing that is that, uh, you know, I now have to, instead of considering two binary variables here, I have to consider a single uh, variable that has four possible states. So basically, I'm going to be carrying messages, vec which are vectors, uh, indexed by the state space across here. And in this case, the vector is going to have to have four elements, which are going to be likelihoods or metrics or weights of some kind. Uh, uh, it's basically telling me what's the weight of a, each of the four possible survivors, if you could think of the trellis that goes with this. Or here, I'm going to need to carry a vector with eight elements. So, uh, you know, it's, it takes more to specify a vector with eight elements than three vectors each with two, each with two elements. So by aggregating these, I've created a sort of exponential complexity situation as these state spaces get very big. Uh, but on the other hand, I get cycle freedom. All right, yeah? There's no real difference between this and what you had before. As President Clinton might have said, it depends what the definition of real is. <laughs> what do you mean by real difference? Uh, I mean, sure. Uh, we think of something u1, u2. You can think of that as two binary variables or a single quaternary variable. Is there any real difference between that? Well, when we actually go to implement decoding algorithms, we'll find there is a real difference in which attitude you take. But mathematically, you know, it's a distinction with hardly any difference. So then there's no fundamental difference between the cycle freeness and the cycle No, you'll see this, this real difference is, a, uh, you know, there is another real significant difference. If I drew this as two binary variables, I have a graph with cycles. And I cannot, we'll find that I can't uh, do exact decoding with a sum product algorithm on a graph with cycles. All right, so if I tried to apply the, that algorithm to this, I'd sort of iterate around this little cycle. All right, whereas if I agglomerate them into a single variable, I get rid of that behavior, and I can summarize everything in four values. All right, so in that sense, it's a huge difference. I didn't get the first part of your question. And can I always transform a cycle, uh, you know, a graph with cycle to a cycle-free graph and use this uh, and combining those? Uh, yeah, okay. So this agglomeration technique uh, of drawing sub uh, lines around subgraphs and then considering everything inside there to be a constraint and all the variables coming out uh, well, it depends on their topology, but uh, I can group the variables coming out however I want. Yes, I can always do that. So we can always do that for things, uh, you know, if there's a zero to error with them. Yeah. We can only well, we transform the graph into a second thing. Right. But we may find uh, that, uh, you know, to make it cycle free, I then have to aggregate all the edges into a single edge between any two parts of the graph. And that may radically increase the complexity. And I'll give you several examples of that today. All right. So these little fine points uh, all of a sudden loom large when we actually come to build something. Uh, let me give you another example of that. A very fine example would be to say, what does sectionalization consist of? We talked about sectionalization. Suppose we want to get a trellis graph for a four-section trellis where we take pairs of variables. Well, the graph realization of that is simply obtained by agglomerating 
uh, pairs of these blocks like that. Okay, so let me do that and then let me see what I've got. I've now got here a constraint that affects two variables. Well, first of all, I've now got only two visible bits in each of the state variables. All right, here I have u1, u2, here I have u2, u3, here I have u3, u4. So uh, we get rid of some of this state complexity. We did this trick in another way before by sectionalization. So we get rid of a lot of state spaces, including ones that are big. Let's see, what do we have here? This is now a code which is Got two bits coming in, two bits coming out. It's a 4-2 code. It's basically controlled by u1 and u2. Probably y0 and y1 are some simple linear function of u1 and u2. So this is a 4-2 constraint code. Controls these two bits and these two state bits. These two symbol bits and these two state bits. What is this over here now? We've got two, two, uh, Two, so this is going to be a code of length six. And what dimension? This is, remember, u2, u3. So this whole behavior here is affected by u1, u2, and u3. It has dimension three. Or there's a shortcut I can do here. Because this is a self-dual code, all of these little codes are going to be self-dual. Well, they're not going to be self-dual, but they're going to be rate one half. You're going to have half as many bits here as they do here. Uh, but that's another duality theorem that we won't prove. OK, and symmetrically, we get a, another code here, which is a 6-3 code, and another one here. So we can do this. this uh, the reason I call this styles of realization is there's obviously a lot of freedom in how we want to depict the code. And depending on how we depict it, uh, when we get to decoding algorithms, it may affect the complexity of the algorithms. So we want to find a nice way of depicting it. I don't understand why for C1, this, uh, the freedom is 3, because you only have two outputs, the U2 and U3. And you have two outputs, input, uh, U1 C1. and U2. Take out U2, it's only Here, three. two bits here. 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 So it's like six. Length six. Like, like six. All right. How many possibilities are there for these six bits? I've got to consider all possible combinations of u1, u2, and u3 to drive what's happening in these two times. If I go back here and look at those two times, I see that there are three generators that I've got to consider. These three. All right, so for all eight possible linear combinations of those three generators, I'll get different combinations of these six bits here. Okay? Okay, so, uh, and I can go further. Actually, at the end of the day, I concluded here, uh, we said the idea of sectionalization was to sectionalize as far as possible without increasing the branch complexity, which we've now translated into this constraint code complexity. And so it's even better to just keep aggregating. Consider the first half. And this is 1, 2, 3, 4, two bits there. It's still only a 6, 3 code. And the second half is still only a 6, 3 code. When we get to the some product algorithm, that means we have to compute eight things when we get to this node. All right? Maybe it's a slightly more complicated thing, but as long as we keep the dimension down to three, we're only going to have to compute eight things. So we haven't really increased the decoding complexity all by, at all by doing this. So that we consider to be our best uh, sectionalization. And if we tried to aggregate these two, what would we get? We'd simply get the eight bits here. We get a constraint that says, it's an 8-4 constraint that says these eight bits have got to be in the code. <laughs> so we don't want to go that far, because that would increase the complexity to 16. All right, so that's our, that's our minimal trellis. We call it a two-section trellis, where the 
symbol bits have been grouped into four tuples. All right, and for decoding, that's the that's the sim simplest one. Okay. Uh, so you see what kind of games we can play here? Yeah. Well, uh, if you remember in more, in more detail uh, how we concluded this was the opti optimal sectionalization, we looked at time three in particular. We said there are three generators that are active at time three. So I want to expand that as far as I can without bringing any more generators into the picture. So I can't expand it over here because I'll hit U4, but I can expand it as far as I want over here. And that's the way we sectionalize. So well, there's some art in this, all right? Here it's kind of obvious where to do it. Uh, uh, and the, I give two heuristic algorithms in the notes on sectionalization, which are, will, will come up with basically the same thing. But for simple codes, you can just eyeball it. Okay, so uh, let's see. That's another general and very useful style of realization. It's a trellis realization or a sectionalized trellis realization. Is there anything else I wanted to say about that? We can do it so that we get minimal branch and state spaces or constraint complexities. Uh, it's cycle free if we aggregate the states into a single state space. Sectionalization, we've talked about that. Okay, so let me leave that up because we're, of course, not done with that. Now let me talk about some general properties of graph realizations. We've and the important, well, the most important thing I'm going to talk about here is the cut set bound. Uh, I want to get across the idea that uh, uh, the graph, a graph really captures dependency relationships. All right, if uh, variables are incident on the same node, they're obviously all dependent. Or if you think of larger sets of variables aggregated in this way, then they're somehow dependent. Variables that are very far away in the graph are less dependent on each other than ones that are close to each other in the graph. This is all kind of vague and woolly statements. Let's see if we can make them more concrete. Uh, first of all, there's a very simple but important observation that, uh, put it this way, disconnected if and only if independent. What does this mean? If I have a disconnected graph, let's suppose I have one graph over here with certain external variables. Let me aggregate them all into Y1 and some constraint one over here. And a completely separate graph, some different code over here, C2, constraining some separate set of variables, Y2. Okay, that's a disconnected graph realization. It has to look like that, right? Subject to aggregating the two disconnected halves. All right, what can I say? What code does this graph realize? This graph realizes, the code that it realizes, is simply the Cartesian product of C1 and C2. In other words, what does this mean? It's a set of all pairs, C1, C2, or I should say Y1, Y2, Y1, Y2, such that Y1 is in code 1 and Y2 is in code 2. That is the set of all Y1, Y2 that satisfy all these constraints, right? So it's a behavioral realization of a Cartesian product code. Now this is really a notion of independence, right? We can, this independently realizes a uh, code word from C1 in this part and a code word from C2 in this part. 
What would the generator matrix look like? The generator matrix from this would look like a generator for C1, zeros, zeros, and a generator for C2. So there's a generator matrix notion of independence. In other words, these are just two independent codes that for some reason we choose to regard as one code. And this, the same thing is true that if we have a Cartesian product code, simply a code made up of two independent components, then we can always realize it in this way, right? We just realize C1, realize C2. So that's elementary, but it begins to get across the idea that uh, graph properties have to do with dependence properties. And here's a, the most radical and simple form of that. If we have a disconnected graph, then it really realizes two independent codes. Okay? Now, more important than that is the cut set bound. What is a cut set? It's a set of edges. It's actually in graph theory, it's defined in various ways. It could be vertices, could be edges. Here we're going to say it's a set of edges whose removal disconnects the graph. Probably there are people in this room who know more graph theory than I do. Does anyone want to quibble or refine that in any way? That's my idea of what a cut set is. That's what I'm going to use. Any elaboration? No. All right. All right. So we have some large graph realization. You know, it's got vertices, which I always draw as blocks, as constraint codes. It's uh, they have various interrelationships. I'm just showing one. We have various external variables that we bring out of that, and that's a, that's the general graphical realization of a code. What are what are some cut sets in here? I've drawn this. I'm thinking of this as a cut set. If I take these two edges and remove them. then I've disconnected the graph, so they form a cut set. I've already mentioned the very close connect connection between cut sets and cycle-free graphs, which is a graph is cycle-free if and only if, by removing any single edge, I disconnect the graph. So every single edge is itself a cut set. That's a very elegant characterization. All right, so I'm thinking of a cut set. I'm going to write it as uh, chi for scissors, and uh, it's a set of edges. So in our cases, what are the edges? It's a set of state spaces for some index set. Okay, so I'm going to select some minimal set of state spaces that disconnects the graph. All, right. all, my, all my edges are internal variables. We don't really need to worry about these half edges out here, as I've said before. They always just, you know, they're always going to trivially uh, separate their variables from the rest of the graph, and it's just tedious to try to keep them in the explanation. So we're only talking about state edges here. All right, once I've done that, uh, let me now do my agglomeration trick. Sorry, I'm trying to draw a line around the, a dotted line around a part of the graph and leave outside the, uh, the external variables that I still want to be external. I'm going to leave the state variables, uh, which I'm going to remember were once connected, and let me reconnect them now. All right, so I'm taking my original graph and I'm dividing it according to this cut set into two parts. And I'm arbitrarily going to call this the past P, arbitrarily but suggestively, and the future F. And it doesn't matter which one I 
call P in which one F. All right. I'm going to redraw this. So this is just a redrawing of that in a nicer form. I'm going to aggregate all of these variables over here, and I'm going to call that the set of past external variables, Y projected on the past. And similarly over here, I'll get the set of all external variables projected on the future. It was just the ones that occur in the when I make this kind of cut through state edges, some of the external variables wind up in the past side and some wind up connected to the future side, but there are obviously none connected to both because of the definition of a cut set. We've disconnected the graph. So, all right, so there's the past, there's the future. And then here are the state variables. Now I'm going to def define these all together as a superstate space, as I did in the trellis graph over there. So, let's see, here I labeled the edges by a set of states, but what I mean here is that uh, the superstate space is just the product of the component state spaces. Its elements, S chi, are just uh, the set of Sj. J in sigma J. Is that clear? In other words, I have a vector of states here, and uh, I consider the superstate space to be just the Cartesian. This again is a Cartesian product of all these state spaces. Okay, and then I have constraints. So we'll call this the past, the aggregate past constraint, and the aggregate future constraint that constrains. These vari this constrains these variables in the state. This constrains these variables in that state. Okay, so that's where figure five comes from. Every year people says, say, how did you get figure five? This is how I get figure five. So is there any confusion about that? Today I've been talking about agglomeration quite a bit, so maybe, maybe this year it'll come through better than in past years. It's just the aggregate of all these uh, constraints. It's uh, what is what does this say? It's the set of all possible values of these variables and these variables that can actually occur. That forms a linear space, which we call a little code. Anything consistent with that satisfies this constraint. Anything else doesn't. The C's projection, projection of the code on the past? Uh, no. This is not the project, projection on the, of the code on the past would be you realize the code and you just project onto these variables here. So no, this is just an index. This is a constraint whose index is the past. Okay. Well, all right. Hope it this looks like a trellis, like a two-section trellis. It looks very much like this thing right here. Right? It has the same general form. And what we can think of this superstate variable here. It sort of has the, Mar the Markov property. It, again, tells everything about the past that is needed to specify what possible futures there could be. We're really interested in these up here eventually. But this is the whole set of constraints that determine the futures, along with there may be some more free variables over here. But this is, this, these are the constraints we get from this half of the code on this half of the code and vice versa. All right, so again, a cut set is related to a Markov property. Let me try to state this property more explicitly. The code by the behavioral realization is simply the set of all combinations of, uh, let me say the behavior is the set of all 
past states and futures that satisfy the constraints. OK, so this gives me a certain set of paths that are consistent with each possible value of the state variable. Let's call that y projected on the pass that's, that's consistent with a particular value of the state variable, or the superstate, the vector of states here. And these are the ones in the future that are consistent with that state variable. Let me define that. So the set of all possible past and future y's is simply this Cartesian product. Let me say that in a more graph theoretic way. If I specify the state here as some particular value, Sx, and I fix that, I've really disconnected the graph. All right? I can then, for a fixed Sx, I can just put that over here, put that over here. And this realizes, now this is a disconnected graph that realizes the Cartesian product of whatever of yp of sx, this just comes through and affects that, with yf of sx. All right, so for any particular value of the state, I have a Cartesian, certain Cartesian product of pasts and futures that can occur. Any past that's con connected with that state can be connected to any future that's connected with this, this state. All the possible future continuations of any particular past in this equivalence class are the same. This should sound very much like the kinds of things we were talking about when we did the state space theorem. All right. And we get a sort of state space theorem out of this. Just to draw this out, we kind of get a two-section trellis realization. Where we have the various states in the state space here, S0, S1, and so forth. We have the paths that are connected with S0, S1, and so forth. And we have the futures that are connected to S0, S1. So. All right. So we could get from this, this picture of a two-section trellis. We have a set of parallel, this is really represents a set of parallel transitions here. These are all the possible paths that could go to are consistent with that state. These are all the futures that are consistent with that state. We can tie them together, and that realizes the code. I should say explicitly, the code now is the union over uh, the states in the state space, the superstate space of uh, the past there times the futures. Very consistent with the state. So it's a union of Cartesian products. And that's expressed by this diagram. This is one of them. This is another one. These are all of them. How many are there? Size of the superstate variable, which, by the way, is the product of the sizes of the state spaces of each of these individual state spaces that I had coming across here. Right. So, okay. What's the cut set bound, then? For linear codes, it's basically the same as the state space theorem. The state space theorem 
said that the dimension of the state space at any time, well, let me consider now this state space, the superstate variable. The dimension of this superstate variable has got to be greater than or equal to the dimension of the code that we're realizing minus the dimension of the, this is going to be bad notation now, because I've, all right, this is, now I mean the subcode. So I should have written something else for the constraint here. Minus the dimension of the subcode whose support is entirely on the past, minus the dimension of the subcode whose support is entirely on the future. And the state space theorem still applies. Okay, for this partition. So that gives me a lower bound on the dimension, the total dimension of the states in any cut set. All right. So, for, for example, in the 844 code, suppose we have any realization, so some graph here, and any cut set such that the size of the I should say the dimension I really mean that there are four external variables in the past and in the future this dimension dimension as we have four variables sticking out here and four variables sticking out here and we have a cut set somehow going through there. All right, so our picture now is going to look something like this. What's the minimum possible dimension of the uh, total dimension of the edges that cross this, uh, cus this cut set, the state spaces that are in this cut set? We know this code very well now. What's the Maximum, let's do the Mütter bound. What's the maximum dimension? Dimension of the code is four. What's the maximum dimension of any code that, uh, that lives on the past? It's one, because such a code has to have minimum distance four. So there's, it can't have dimension greater than the repetition code of length four. So four minus one, same argument for the future, equals two. So it says that however you do it, you're going to have to have at least two binary edges or one quaternary edge crossing a cut set that divides the external variables into two equal sized parts. So let's go further. Let's suppose we want a cycle free graph. Okay, if we have a cycle-free graph, then all the cut sets are single edges. All right, so uh, in a cycle-free graph, when we make a cut, it's through a single edge. And we're saying the state space at the, if there's a way you can make a cut that divides this into two equal parts, the state space has to uh, have dimension two, it has to have size four for any cycle-free graph. Right. Uh, you know, similarly, if we have the 24, 12, 8 code, we've proved that the minimum dimension uh, of any central cut has to be at least 6. No, the center it has to be at least 8, right? Uh, yeah, because the dimension of the code is 12, and a subcode uh, that has support on 12 can't have dimension more than 2. This can't have dimension more than 2, so that would be 8. So for the 24, 12, 8 code, 
This, the set of edges that cross the cut have to have total dimension at least 8. And if we want it to be cycle-free, then there has to be a single edge that has dimension 8. So the uh, conclusion general conclusions suppose we go from we first talked about trellis realizations we can generalize that to any cycle free realization and we're going to see that we have strong motivation to keep our realization cycle free because then we can do exact maximum likelihood decoding uh, so we'd like to have cycle-free realizations. But what have we just seen? We've just seen that the, uh, the state complexity cannot be less than that of a trellis. realization with a cut with a comparable cut in other words one that divides the past and future in the same way divides the external variables into the same size okay so we really can't can't beat the trellis bounds the motor bound in particular now again, there's some games we can play. Let's let's uh, ask about the 24, 12, 8 cut. We've said we can't get less than if we want to realize it with a cycle-free realization. This says, well, if we have a cut that divides the two uh, the external variables into two parts of size eight, then we're going to be stuck with a state space of dimension eight and a size 256. No way around it. All right, here's a slight way around it. Let me hypothesize a realization that looks like this. Uh, this is a 14.7 code. So is this. So is this. We're going to divide the external variables into three parts, each of size 8. And we're going to have three internal state spaces, each of dimension 6. And we're going to constrain those by an 18.9 code. And again, these all have rate 1 half because this code is dual. Now, is there anything in what I've done that prevents this kind of realization? Let's test the cut sets. Where are the cut sets? In, well, A, is this a cycle-free realization? Yes. Okay, good. Let's test the cut sets. It's kind of a three-way symmetrical thing. The internal cut sets are here, here, and here. All right? Each of these cut sets divides the coordinates into one set of size 8 and one set of size 16. In that case, what does the Mütter bound give us? In that case, 816, the dimension of the code is still 12. The minimum dimension of a code of length 16 and minimum distance 8 is 5. And one of length 8 and minimum distance 8 is 1. So as we did on the homework, we find that uh, we are permitted to have a state space. The minimal state space here could have dimension 6. So this, is, this possibly could occur. Again, we're kind of camouflaging some of the state space. You see, there is no central state space in this. There is no cut set that partitions it into 12 and 12. So by being a little bit clever, we've got it down to something where instead of a 256 state central state space, we've got three 64 state, state spaces. And this is what we saw in the trellis realization, too, that if we 
sectionalized into three sections, then we get a 64 state and a 64 state at the boundaries between the three sections. But we still got the same 512 branch complexity in the middle. And what do you know, we still have a constraint code with complexity 512 here too. So if you consider that the more valid measure of complexity, minimum dimension of any constraint code or branch space, then we haven't improved. So subject to these qualifiers, this is a pretty strong argument that by going beyond trellis realizations to general state state states, general cycle free graphical realizations, we can't gain very much. All right. So the moral is you know, to to significantly reduce complexity, we're gonna need to go to graphs with cycles. We must go to graphs with cycles. Okay, so that's, you know, you don't get much for free in this life. Uh, so when we get to our sum product decoding algorithm, we're going to have to apply it to graphs with cycles where it's iterative, where it's not exact, where it's uh, just a lot less nice. So what do we do when we go to graphs with cycles? Where is the potential gain? The potential gain is that now this superstate variable could be made up of, uh, of a number of simpler variables. We've got to distribute, we've got a certain minimum dimension that we're going to need in any cut set, like uh, 8 for the central state space of the Golay code. But now we can, we can spread it around over two or more uh, sub-state variables. So for instance, maybe we can find something where we we now have a graph with cycles where uh, we have two state spaces here. Here's the cycle again. And the two state spaces each have size only 16. That would still satisfy this cut set bound. So we greatly reduce the, uh, uh, the size of the state spaces, uh, which is exponential in their dimension but at the cost of introducing a cycle. I insist that's a cycle. Let's go over to this trellis here. Next thing I might talk about is tail-biting trellis realizations. This is very simple. What's the first realization you would think of on a graph with a cycle? Well, here's a trellis realization. It's always going to look like this. And then let's just loop this around. In other words, we make the last state space equal to the first state space. We don't require these to be trivial state spaces of size one. We allow them to have some dimension. And here's a potential realization on a graph with a cycle. All right. Cut sets. What are the, where are the cut sets in this graph? All the cut sets now look sort of like that. All the cut sets involve at least two edges, two state spaces. Okay, so we potentially might get this kind of benefit. Here's an example. Suppose instead, go back to our very favorite example. Suppose we let U2 go across here. And we bring out U3 out of here. Bring it all the way back to here. Everything's still good? That's obviously another realization. Now I've made it clear that when I draw U2 and U3 separately here, I've really got a cycle. You know, I've made a big cycle. Uh, and now, uh, what's the number of states in this two-section realization of the 8-4 code? This is a two-state tail-biting trellis, because each of these has, is just a little binary variable. Okay, 
So I get some kind of two-state trellis. If I were actually to draw out the trellis, I would have two states at time zero, two states at time four, uh, some kind of, what have I got, six three. So I've got eight branches that go back and forth, a couple of parallel branches. It's going to look like that. Uh, then same thing out to time eight. I don't have a time eight. This is really time zero again. Where I identify these two state spaces. This is really the same state as this. And this is the same one as that. So that's if I really drew out the trellis in the style of I originally drew trellises. This would be a uh, a picture of all the, uh, there's a one-to-one -one map between all the paths through this trellis that start and end in the same state, because that's what I mean when I identify the beginning and end states. So there are, if I start in this state, there are a four-way branch here, another four-way branch there. There's 16 possible, is that right? No, there's only a two-way branch such that I can get back to the initial state. So there are eight possible paths that start here and get back to the same state, eight possible paths that start out from here and get back to the same state, and they well, together uh, correspond one-to-one -to, -one to all the, the code words. Okay, well, that's not a very big deal. I was able to reduce a four-state trellis to a two-state trellis. Uh, but suppose I do the same thing with the with the Golay code. Golay code, there's a very beautiful tail bright, tail biting trellis realization. That looks like this. It has twelve sections. So maybe I won't draw all the sections. It has it groups each of the output variables into pairs. And comes around like that. And each of these state spaces has dimension 4, or size 16. And I give the generator matrix for this in the notes. So this is for the 24, 12, 8 code. And now you test me. Is this a possible? Use the cut set bound. See if this violates the cut set bound anywhere, does it? For this code? No, it doesn't, because every, every cut set, no matter how I draw it, we're going to get two edges, each of dimension four, adding up to a superstate of dimension eight. And uh, the state spaces at all the even times, notice I've sectionalized here, so I only need to look at even times. The state spaces at all even times in this code uh, could be could have dimension as small as eight. Remember, at the odd times they go up to nine, and these are all little four four. These are all little ten five codes. So the the branch complexity is only thirty two. So this is very much simpler than any of the conventional trellises that I've than the minimal conventional trellis that we were able to draw for this code or this funny little pinwheel with three arms on it, which is also a cycle-free realization of this code. Okay, so by going to tail biting, that's a significant advance. Uh, and a side note, if we just break this, it turns out we have a generator matrix that has period four. We get, and let this go on, Infinitely, this is the a realization of a rate one half sixteen state branch complexity thirty two, as we expect, perfectly conventional except it's periodically time varying. linear convolutional code with absolutely phenomenal performance. Like the Golay code, it has d equals 8. 
therefore it has a coding gain, nominal coding gain of 4, 1 half times 8, or 6 dB. This is with only a 16 state rate 1 half code. Look at the ones in the table. This is significantly better than that. And it's effective coding gain. I forget, but it's still very good. Excellent <laughs> for the complexity of this code. So this is called the Golay convolutional code. And uh, it's an interesting example of the interplay between this block coding stuff and the convolutional coding stuff in this case. Actually, this code was first discovered in computer searches, but nobody realized how wonderful it was. And it was only when its connection with this Golay code was recognized that uh, people realized this was really a special code, both from a performance versus complexity point of view and also algebraically. Okay, well, that uh, brings us to the end. There's actually one more style of graph realization that I want to mention to you. Uh, for the Reed-Muller codes, we know that they're basically based on Hadamard transforms. It's a very nice kind of uh, Fourier transform-like graph realization of Hadamard transforms. So that gives us another style of realization of Reed-Muller codes that, again, we can aggregate to lead to a lot of nice, uh, nice structures. Again, at the end of the day, unless we go cycle-free, we don't really... Um, unless we allow cycles, we don't really gain anything. So I'll do that the first time, first part of next time, and then do the sum product algorithm. Hope I can do it in one lecture.